OK, cool. So sorry about that slight technical hiccup, but we're all good now. Who knows why it happened? Um, this is a spider and we are going to identify this spider. Um, so I'll just move it all. Um, so if, if you can see, it's got um, just to remind ourselves of the anatomy of a spider. It's got two um, body parts. Can you see my cursor? Yeah. Cool. So it's got um, the cephalothorax, which is the head and body combined, with the legs coming off it and the, the palps. And remember, in a male, these would be modified into secondary sexual organs. Um, it's got its chelicerae, its jaws and its eyes are here. They might not be super visible right now, um, but we should be able to zoom in and look at them later. And then it's got its abdomen, which has the rest of its organs and spinneret at the end. And I'm going to have a look. I'm going to use the uh, Roberts guide to identify it. And I'll read out questions. And I think at some point I might try screen sharing just so as you can see one of the questions, because it's one that does trip people up quite a lot. Uh, oh, my goodness, threats have been found according to this notification. Anyway, um, so the the first question in the key asks whether or not the tarsus, which is the end of the palp, is swollen or modified in any way. So it's basically asking, is it a male or a female spider? Um, and in this case, if we look at the spider, we can see that the palp, which is this, is not modified in any way. It just you know ends as you'd expect, like a leg to end. So it is not an adult male spider. And then question two, uh, sorry, the, so we go on to question two. And it's asking, is the, does the underside of the abdomen have an epigyne? So that's the female genitals that are um, like they're sclerotized, so hardened, um, like the lock and key thing. I should say that just a totally random thing, but something which I think is amazing and shows how much we still have to learn, is that um, it, up until very recently, like we're talking in the last couple of years, it was thought that the epigyne was the modification of the female genital opening um, that you know other spiders would have without an epigyne. And so when the male mates, the... Um, the this the sperm is going into the female's genitals but in fact a study has found um, quite recently that the epigyne is a completely separate structure to the female's genital openings and there's a separate genital opening still and it's um, developed from an entirely different um, tissue of the spider as well so it's just an entirely separate thing and what amazes me about that is we people have been looking at spiders presumably for hundreds of years and this is a pretty fundamental part of their of their you know body that has just been overlooked. So there's just so much to find out about these wonderful things. But anyway, that's a complete tangent, which is something I tend to do. Let's turn the spider over. So if you can see there, there's a there's this here, a sort of postage stamp. Um, like thing, this is the, the epigyne, the genitals of the female. So we know we have an adult female. And so the key says, yeah, you've got an adult female. Um, and we know where to go. Um, so we then have to go to the main key, which is the family key. Um, and the family key has lots of pictures. But I can take you through most of those um, as we go through it. The, the, but I'll, I'll screen share a particular one. So the first question um, is whether or not the chelicerae, that's the jaws, um, points for uh, your point this way or this way. So if we have a look at that. Sorry, I could do with a third hand like Zephod Beeblebrox right now. Um, so there's the chelicerae from the underside. And as we can, as you can probably hopefully see, they're pointing inwards towards each other, not backwards along the body. So we know we've got um, an areniomorph, a libidignatha, not the um, megalomorphs or orthognatha. So um, 
so because of that, we get to go to question two. And question two asks a question, which is, is uh, does the spider have a cribellum? Now, the cribellum is a special organ that allows some families of spiders to produce a special kind of silk called cribellate silk. So if we look at the spinneret end of the, uh, of the abdomen, um, these are the spinnerets of the spider. This is what makes the silk. And you're going to have to take my word for it at this point that had there been a cribellum present, we would see it right here. And there's no structures there, so it doesn't have a cribellum. But this is like an example of where, um, you know, you get questions and keys and a degree of knowledge is necessary in advance to really understand what you're looking for. And so I do have a cribellet spider that if we have time later and people wanted to, I could put it under the microscope and show you what a cribellum looks like. Um, but this doesn't have one. So, so we select cribellum absent and go to question seven. And question seven um, asks, does the spider have six or eight eyes, basically? So let's have a look at how many eyes the spider has got. So this spider here, I can see one, two, three, four eyes. So not enough eyes now. And here it's maybe a little tricky to see, but just above the lip um, of the spider, there's one, two, three, four. So there are eight eyes. As you can see, spider eye arrangements are not always the easiest to count under a microscope without moving them around a bit. So that takes us to question nine. And question nine is the one I'd quite like to screen share with you. Um, so I'm just going to stop sharing this and share another thing. Or in fact, maybe not. I'll, how clearly can you, if I hold this up, how clearly can you see it? Not very. Uh, not very clearly. We we can see it. I'll see if I can actually spotlight you again. There we go. I can I can actually spotlight you while you're holding that up, and hopefully that makes you large. Cool. There you go. That <laughs> I've works. Never been, I've never been large before. Uh, <laughs> so, anyway, all I really want to show you, uh, you don't have to take any of it in, other than this is question nine. And question nine is asking you basically, which of these does your spider fit? And it's got lots of pictures. Um, when I run courses and things, people try and pick a picture from this page, but it continues to this page and there are more to choose from. And it continues to this page and there are more to choose from. And then at the very end, um, at the very bottom of this page, it's got an option that says spider not fitting descriptions in any of those and people miss that one too. So it's a tricky one. Um, you need to go through a lot of pages basically and at the end of the day it is acceptable to come out with an answer which is none of the above. Um, so just to be aware of that. Um, in this case, um, I'm not going to go through all of the ones and show you them all. But this one does meet a does fit a description. It fits uh, description nine F, which is lycosidae. So I know that I've got a lycosid, and then it tells you to go to another page. So I shall go to that page. So when you go to the family section of this book, it's the Collins uh, Mike Roberts book. It has um, a description of the family and then it has a family key. Um, so there's another key to go through. And in this case, it, it says question one, um, are, does, uh, is the patella of the palps white? And um, I mean, in this case, you can see there is no white on the palps, so no. Um, so go to question two, 
and it asks is the height of the clippiest, that's the face. Um, so the face of the spider is the gap between its eyes and its lip. Um, is it twice the diameter of um, an anterior lateral eye or is it narrower than that? Um, and that, that's quite difficult to see. Um, you need to maneuver the spider to look at you. And yeah, one of the limitations of I uh, need to look for some kind of better camera solution, but one of the limitations is it can be quite hard to see think dark things. Mm -hmm. Right, so that kind of glinty bit is the eyes and then there's a gap and then there's the jaws and it is quite a big gap in this case. Something I find more useful though is that spiders that have a big face also have quite a steep sided head and spiders that have, at least in Lycosidae, and the spiders that have got a short face tend to have quite a broadly sloping head. So the shape of the head can be very useful. It's just not made a big deal of in the key. So if it's got quite steep sides, the likelihood is that it will also have this big face. That, say, that takes us to question three, um, to split it between two gen genera. And the, the question there is, um, it has various elements to it. it can, you can look at spines on different parts of the legs, um, but what's more obvious and is just as characteristic is the shape of the cephalothorax again. So um, it, one of the questions is from the front, does it have almost vertical sides or do they slope a bit? Um, and this spider, I don't know if we can get it back looking at you. The spider has pretty much vertical sides to its its cephalothorax. It's like a square, I would say. So that tells us that this is the genus Pardosa. And so after you've got that, um, the the book takes you to another section, which will tell you about the genus. And that's us done with keys. Um, at this point, it's about looking at the genitals. Um, so it shows you a series of drawings. Um, so I, am I still spotlighted? I can't hear you, Craig. <laughs> Apologies, <laughs> I was muted. Uh, yeah, I'm just cool. going to spotlight you now. Cool. Um, cool. So, yeah. <laughs> Dave. If I can, sorry, bear with me. Um, yeah, no worries. I'll turn the spider over while you're doing it. Can you still see the spider as well, or is it just me that you see? No, it? we can either see the spider or the big uh, we can either see the spider or you once I've spotlighted you. Um, there we go. So I've spotlighted you, and now we can see you. But then I'll need to switch back to the spider. So let me know if you want to switch back to your slide. Yeah, we will do that in a moment. Um, but we'll do this first. Oh, her legs have moved awkwardly. Never okay. mind. Can I just interrupt you for a moment? Um, Chris, Catherine's asked, um, are there some spiders that you can ID to species in the field with just a hand lens, or does that need considerable experience? Um, so yes, there are some species of spider that you can ID in the field with a hand lens. There are some you can ID in the field without a hand lens. Um, but you will be able to ID a lot more in the field uh, without with or without a hand lens after when you get experience so um a lot of a lot of these spiders this like the wolf spiders like osids that we're looking at one of at the moment i can do a lot of these um in the field um so yeah but that's a bit with a bit of experience i think it's there are some really distinctive differences between some spiders when you look closely but i think for those differences to be distinctive you need to have a lot of experience of seeing other spiders first if that makes sense yeah, 
Yeah. Um, so for instance, I think I'm pretty sure that I can tell the difference confidently between the three species of Heliophanus that occur in Scotland, which look effectively to all intents and purposes identical um, based on some markings on the undersides of their legs. I'm sure that this, I'm sure that it's consistent, but I've noticed this by looking at a lot of spiders. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, I will show you. Right, so I'm still spotlighted. So I just wanted to show you that um, when you get to this part of the book, there is lots of uh, drawings. So this is like the, the epigyne. This is the male palp from two different angles. Um, and you need to compare your spider to this, which is why I was suggesting, particularly when you're starting out, actually doing a wee doodle of what you see under your microscope and then comparing it can be easier than going backwards and forwards from the microscope. Um, so in this case, we'd be looking through and comparing it to the spider. If Craig can take us back to the spider, um, we'll have a look at its epigyne. Yep. Yep. So. So this is the epigyne of our paradosa here. And this is what we need to look at to, and compare with our book to determine what species it is. So uh, because we can't show the two at the same time, let's just try and memorize this or maybe you can doodle it yourself. Um, so it's kind of square shaped. It's got these openings. So that's where the male would insert his palps. And it has this, I think, like kind of shield shape thing under it with a wee joint. So we need to find something that looks like that in our book. Um, so if Craig could put me back to Spotlight. That, that's you spotlighted. So I um, so because I can't see myself, I don't quite know what you can see, but the there's nothing on this page that to me looks like that kind of square shape that's that we were looking at. So we turn the page. And get to the next one. And in this in this case, I, I think that there's a couple on this page that look like it. These two at the bottom um, are both kind of square shaped and have the, that shield. Um, however, this one has the sort of bigger um, square bit at the top and this one's got a sort of more pinched bit so i would say that our spider looks like this um i don't know if craig can pop us back to the other this microscope yeah we're on the microscope now so yeah so i think that part is, so that looks like that picture in the book and so that would mean that this is pardosa amentata which is a pretty common wolf spider that you would probably have in your gardens um in fact, this one is from my garden. Um, if we can just go back to Spotlight again, I just want to show another Pardosa. So this is part. Sorry, one one moment, Chris. Spotlight. Yeah, there you go. So this is Pardosa pilata. This is another very common Pardosa. I have both of these in my garden, um, but you can see the. The epigyne is really distinctively different between them, which is quite handy. So if you have if you have these spiders in your garden, you should be able to tell them apart. Um, and this is you can see these epigynes well enough um, at, with a hand lens, particularly when you get your eye in. Um, but yeah, looking at things and getting experience is very useful. So that's so we've gone through the key um, for this wolf spider, and I think the key works quite well. For identifying this spider. I don't know what other people's views would be. It's also really interesting for me, by the way, because I, I learned how to identify spiders a long time ago, and this book didn't exist when I learned how to identify them. Um, and I, I don't need to go through the, this, the family key and things to work out what kind of spider I've got. The genitals are all I need. Um, so it's been really interesting running these courses via Zoom and Teams because um, it's forced me to actually go through the key rather than just help people go through the key. So yeah, that's been fun. Does anyone have any questions on that? Or shall we move over to look at another spider? No, just, to, just to comment on that, it, is, uh, it, it does sound like it 
it's been a, a process that you've had to go through of getting back to basics and trying to talk people through the simple process that you need to go through um, and and use the use of a key for for many people they won't have had much experience working through keys in the past and uh, it is fairly straightforward if you take it one question at a time and uh, having you talk us through it as you just did with that wolf spider uh, makes the process very straightforward and you know if if we were able to have that book in front of us have that key in front of us then I'm sure everybody that's that's listening would be able to work through that process um, simply enough that's the the trouble with these online workshops as opposed to doing these face to face but yeah absolutely but I have to say that is interesting for me anyway because like a, a, in a normal situation I would just give all of you a book and a spider and tell you crack on um, and then you'd get help from me so the, oh, I might actually pick a different spider hold on um, Ask what magnification your microscope is set at. Um, well, I'm using. I've been using Zoom feature, so it's been variable. Um, the maximum that this one can go up to is 120, and it, the minimum is um, 60. So it's always been relatively high. Um, but that, that said, actually, that's not going to be the case because I'm running it through my camera. Um, so actually, it will be half that. Um, so the maximum that I can get to with the camera is 60. Um, because it doesn't go through another lens that I've got in. So it's lower magnification than I usually use. Thank you. So yeah, if you were able to look through my, my microscope, you would see things bigger and also more clearly. I can't quite get, for whatever reason, I can't quite get the camera to, I think because the camera won't focus, won't do infinite focus. Um, it's all a case of moving through different planes. So it's for me to try and find something that works better. <laughs> um, so let's see if we can get the spider manipulated so you can see it. I'll switch back to your microscope view now, okay. Chris. So here we have another spider. Um, oh, its abdomen's popped off. That's not ideal either. Um, the other one, give me one second. I've got a load of these spiders. And the, this, these spiders are over 10 years old. Um, and some people, they've been handled by a lot of students. Um, so I think some of them have had a rough life. This one's good. Um, a rough afterlife. Yes, a rough afterlife. <laughs> but you can't say their death has been entirely in vain. They've taught a lot of people how to identify spiders, and they were actually caught for a, a structured survey that went into um, planning conservation for sites. So they've been. Catherine's asking, how do you store your reference collection? Is it are they all stored in ethanol? All uh, isopropanol. Um, so there's a big debate between ethanol and isopropanol, and I don't want to get into that. Um, I don't have a horse in the race. All I can say is that isopropanol, you don't need an explosive license for, and ethanol you do. So isopropanol instantly has an advantage because you can just buy it. And um, as far as I'm aware, I know some people who use ethanol and they've stopped and they've had their explosive licenses um, they won't and they haven't re been able to renew their explosive licenses because the licensing agencies have said that they could use isopropanol instead which doesn't need a license which is fair but some people have so it probably depends who you, who your license applications desk uh, whose desk it lands on um anyway some people say that isopropanol makes spiders brittle over time. This isn't something I've found. Um, I mean, I guess it depends how long, but we are looking at a spider that is, um, goodness, when did I collect this spider? Yeah, like about 10 and a half years ago. Um, and it's been isopropanol since, and it is certainly not brittle. Um, so anyway, this is another spider. Um, so as before, we would look at it and see, um, you know, do, do the what what way do the jaws go? Um, well, we do that actually. We'll do the we'll see it sex at first. So there's its palps. 
there's nothing modified about those. Um, and it has an epigyne, so we know this is an adult female. Um, then we would look at its jaws and we can see that they pinch inwards, so it's uh, an Arrhenia-morph Alabithignath. So that takes us to the next bit of the key. I've closed my key, which was silly of me. I've just been doing that from memory. Um, so th that takes us to uh, question two, which is, does the spider have a crevellum? It also asks about these other things called um, calamistrums, and they, they go, their structures on legs with special combs, basically, that make the cribble, help make the cribble at silk. Um, but the crevellum is the easiest thing to see. And yeah, there's, although there are markings, there isn't, there's no, there's no crebellum. The crebellum would be like a sausage-shaped thing here. Um, so there is no crebellum, which gets us to question seven. And this asks how many eyes it has. So let's see how many eyes this spider has. There we go. So it's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The two on each side are very close together and almost joined together, um, but there are eight eyes. So it's an eight-eyed spider. So that takes us back to that question nine. And the good thing about this one and this is where people get caught up. So if I if I were to give this to you guys, I'm sure that you're all brilliant and you would go through the key properly and get this. But when I've run it with particularly um, for like university practicals with like 100 students or whatever, quite a few will not get this one because it gets in question nine. You have to go through all the pages and get to that line at the bottom that says spider not fitting descriptions um, in nine. And then it tells you to go to question 10. So we will continue through the key now beyond question nine. And it asks if the eyes are black and beady when viewed from above and surrounded by a pale area, or if the eyes are pale and surrounded by a black area. So I think you can, uh, it, seems, it looks clearer on my screen. Um, so that to me, the eyes look like they're pale and surrounded by a black area. So that takes us to question 12. And question 12 asks us if the tarsi, that, so at the end of the legs, have got three claws, um, or if they only have two. Let's see if we can manipulate. Let's see if we can find a claw to look at. So that's as close as I can go at the moment. But here's its claws. And uh, I can see, and hopefully you can, that it's got three. So, sorry, Chris, can you just highlight where the three are with your, we can One, see your mouse. Two, three. Okay. And is that 60 times magnification that we're looking at? It's yeah. half the magnification that you actually have because it's connected yeah. to your laptop. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. right. Okay. Um, so yeah, so you can imagine this is quite a, you wouldn't be able to see this with a hand lens. Um, now the next, that takes us to question 15. I have to say it's a bit of a funny one because usually in a key, um, the first option would take you to the, the next question and the second option would take you to the one after that or whatever. But in this case, um, the first option takes you to question 15 and the second option takes you to question 13, which is very confusing anyway. We'll go to question 15. 
And question 15 is a real doozy um, because it, say, it, it basically says, does the fourth tarsus, so that's the back leg, um, have a comb of serrated bristles on the underside um, that um, split like you know they're by, they've got lots of little splits to them um, and it does say that actually so it's basically it's like a comb and it does go on to say that um, this may not even be visible under a microscope which is a super helpful thing in a key um, now I'm not sure this is one of the biggest species in this family It's missing the end of that one. It's basically uh, a very difficult thing to see. What it can look like is slightly thicker spines. But with the magnification we have, it is very difficult. Um, so basically, my point here is that you can get pretty stuck with a key um, when it has a question like that. And that's why sometimes, um, yeah, also it's even more confusing actually because it says abdominal pattern or at least some light markings, but with but a very few are unicolorist gray or black, which is not massively helpful either. Um, so yeah, that kind of gets you stuck. I can tell you the answer. And in this case, it does have a comb, um, but a better way of finding a way that you could find this, if you get stuck in a key and you got a bunch of pictures, you can look at the pictures. And I think a lot, I think a lot of, um, sometimes in entomology and arachnology, people get a bit fixed on, you got to go through the key and work things out. And I definitely say you should try and go through the key and you should learn all the features and things because that's really important and you can make mistakes with pictures. But if you do get stuck, there's nothing wrong with looking through the pictures. Um, and if you give me a second, I'm going to find a picture of this spider for you. Um, OK, cool. Oh, so so I spot like you, Chris. Yeah. So if I'm spotlighted. Yeah. Um, this is the spider we have. It's quite distinctive. Um, so I think we've got the form that looks like this. Um, but you get these other forms. It's called the candy stripe spider, Enoplugnatha. Um, there are. So Sorry, Chris, if you could tilt the book, yeah, then we're getting a bit of glare when you're tipping the book back, but that's that much better? better, much okay. better. Can you, see, can you see what I'm pointing at? Yeah. Cool. So it's this one here, Enoplugnatha, um, and it's, like I say, called Candy Stripe Spider, and there's a few different um, ways it can look. Now, it's um, there is another spider in the book which looks a bit similar, but if you, uh, I think if you, the thing is, if you get to that one and then you look at the genitals, you would see it's not that species. Um, so you can work it out. So again, a combination of looking at pictures and using a key is not a bad way of going about things. And it's really interesting running this kind of stuff for like a university um, class where you've got 100 people and everyone's brains works, work in a slightly different way. And some people are really good at going through keys and other people tend to work visually. And the people who are good at going key through keys tend to get the first one right, and the visual ones tend to get them wrong. And people who are visual tend to get this one right, um, and the people who go through keys tend to get stuck. So try and use both, I would say. There are two species of Enoplugnatha, though, um, so you do need to look at the genitals. You can't just go, it's definitely Enoplugnatha ovata, which it probably will be because it's the most common one. So you can unspotlight me now. Okay. Yep, that's your microscope back. Cool. 
So we get back to our spider. Great thing about things floating in liquid is they don't quite turn the way that you turn the excavated glass thingy. So let us go. To, so it's so the family that it's in is Therididae, uh, which is uh, if get to the right pigs on. And there is a key at the start of the third day section that you can go through. Um, but in our case, we you know we know that we've got Enoplugnatha. Um, although let's see if I can show you a Colios. Just about. So, um, the que if you do key these out, it asks you if it has a colulus. And that's one of these great things of, you know, just what is a colulus if you've never seen one. Um, but there's a there's a wee it's almost like an extra wee spinneret that's just between the others in here. Um, it's not as clear as I would maybe like it to be. I don't know if I can turn up the mag the light if that helps. But there is a small there is a, a small structure that looks like it almost like it could be a tiny extra spinneret in here this area, um, and that's a key thing in identifying theridids. But like I say, in this case, we know that we have Enoplugnatha for sure. So I would personally just skip to the Enoplugnatha section in this case. And theridids are quite visually distinctive um, with patterns. And in a lot of cases, you'll probably be able to narrow it down to a couple of genre um, based on what it looks like anyway, in which case I would suggest that the way that I would work anyway is I would um, have a look at those genera and see if I can match it to the genitals. And if I can't, then I'd go back and work through the key just to see if I've made a mistake. Um, uh, in a for 289. So I say there's a couple of Enoplugnatha um, that it could be. There's Enoplugnatha ovata and there's Enoplugnatha latamana. Um, so we need to look at the genitals to confirm which one we have. And that is the epigyne of Enoplugnatha. Um, so you, it's actually, I mean, in, it looks pretty dark, and I, and I know that the contrast and stuff and how this gets to you is not quite as it might look under a microscope, but the Enoplugnatha the epigynes often look really dark, and it can be quite hard to see the structures even under normal circumstances. Um, I don't know if I can be spotlighted again for a second, Craig. Yeah. Okay, that's you spotlighted. So there's two, these are the two species that were, that this could be. Um, Enoplugnatha ovata and latamana. And this is ovata epigyne, and this is the um, latamana epigyne. And it can be really hard to see in great detail under a microscope in any circumstance with these, because they do tend to have quite dark epigynes. Um, and people can find them challenging. The key thing that, for me, that stands out is the, this shape here. Um, so on the underside of the epigyne is more or less straight and it, um, there. And with this one, it's got this quite indented shape. So for me, I'm looking, that's the key thing that I'll be looking for um, to quickly decide what kind of en enoplugnatha I've got. Um, so if I'm going to be unspotlighted. Yeah. In this in this case, it's pretty much in line with the ep that line, so the epigastric fold of the spider. Um, if this was latamana, it would have this wee indent here, and it doesn't. Um, so it's kind of it, getting your eye in for these kinds of key features, um, which is something you only really get with experience, I guess. But um, that's the kind of thing that you're looking for. So that finishes the two spiders 
that I would generally take people through. Um, does any, they're both female and what we can do if we have time is I can take a male of one of these out and show you or we can do something else depending on what you would prefer. Um, well, I don't know if anybody else has any specific requests or anything in more detail that they would like to look at. Um, I'd be interested. You referred to an organ around the spinneret that we haven't seen yet. Yeah, would you like to see that? Yeah, what was, sorry, remind me what the name of that organ was? The crebellum. The crebellum, yeah, I'd be interested to actually see one. Yeah, I think that is very useful. Um, I can do that. Let me see if I can find the spider with the crebellum. And, and uh, could, could you explain to us what the crebellum is? I, I think you, you mentioned it. Um, in relation to the, the web, but yeah, I will do we'll what's, have the, what's its function. Let me just see. I've got the, I think this should be a cripple at spider. All my spiders that I use for this are coded as well. So, um, so it's like generally they'd be given out to people and they need to work out what they are. So I'm kind of working mm -hmm. with things. So I'm pretty sure this is why. Is this what I think it is? Oh, this might not be what I was hoping for. One one second, I just need to check that I've I need to check my codes. Okay. No, that's not what I wanted. Hold on. Oh wait, is it? No, it's not. One second, I just need to find a particular number. But the Crebellum while I'm looking is, um, is a structure that is used by the spider to create um, fluffy silk. So the win window lace weavers that you see around your house, um, the webs that are in windows and things that are all fluffy, are made by cribblet spiders. Um, and they have these combs on their legs as well, other special organs that help fluff it up. Um, so it's a, it's a really tangly kind of silk. Um, right, not in that box. Sorry about this. I got the wrong spider out. That's uh, that's interesting. So it, so the crebellum helps the crebellum spiders create a more tangled web, and you had suggested earlier in your presentation that that people arachnologists used to believe that that was a more primitive um, web weaving. Um, strategy, whereas it's, it appears to be the opposite now, the more advanced, the more evolved. Well, um, that's really, that was really referring to other families that do different things. So that was um, Theridids um, right. make a really complicated web, but they don't have cribble at silk. Um, they do use several different kinds of silk, um, but they make a three dimensional web that um, some of which um, so basically like if something gets caught on the top it's been designed in a certain way to catch it and if something get walks along underside there are trip wires that um, that they can get caught on and sort of spring into the air so it's just got a, a it catches things in the three-dimensional world um, in a way that other webs don't so orb webs are actually one of the most primitive kinds of webs even though they look very complicated now, I've managed to go through all my spiders and not find the one I'm looking for, which is interesting. Um, I wonder if I have one. On. My son has been collecting spiders and I've got some of them here. I don't know. If... No. Sorry about that. Um, I definitely have one somewhere here. But I can't find it. Um, yeah, I don't know if I, yeah. 
Yeah, sorry about that. Um, That's all right. Hmm, I can imagine done. that your house is full of spider specimens and you've got quite a few to sift well, through to find um, the ones you want. My office is full of spider specimens. Um, oh, wait, no, here it is. Cool. Right. It is here. Yeah, no, my office is full of loads of spider specimens. I've only got the ones that I use for teaching at home at the moment, plus one that I want to confirm the idea of because there's new knowledge about it. Um, right. Oh, my thing stopped. Right, here we go. Vellums all around. And unfortunately, it's been a bit damaged by people by the looks of it. Um, I'll need to catch another one. There's no shortage of these things around my house. Right. Yeah, sorry. This, and I've, my thing stopped sharing, hasn't it? Oh, battery load. That's not ideal. Um, <laughs> ah, my camera has died. It was freshly charged beforehand as well. Nice. Brilliantly. Um, yeah. I don't know if I can plug this in a second to charge it and see if a wee charge helps. Um, and I'll see if I can find the crabellum quickly. Out there had uh, just commented, uh, Chris, brilliant to go through keys with the microscope. Uh, I think uh, I think he's very, he's, it's very true. It's, it's a useful um, uh, process for us all to go through for those of us that haven't uh, studied spiders in great detail it's been very useful uh, for you to to show us some of these key yeah. features that we need to be looking for um i'm yeah well that's good i'm very sorry i'm gonna have to get another amarobius at some point because it seems that somebody has completely destroyed it <laughs> and this crabellum is gone uh, so um yeah so sorry about that um i'll get another one for another time well, just to understand the function of, uh, of of it as an organ and why some spiders w would want to create this um, more complex web system, the fluffy web system that you were describing. Yep. Well, so, I mean, they, they're, they're webs that they tend to, so they make a, it's a kind of tube web and this really fluffy blue silk comes out from the front of the web and spreads out over a surface. And um, I think it's it, it's got... It's just a lot more tangly. So a lot of spider webs are rely generally are relying on um, silk with glue dots um, that catch things. Uh, whereas this also has this really fluffy, woolly kind of structure to it, which um, just tangles things up really well. Basically, they're they're great. So um, I've actually watched them catching bees and wasps quite a lot. So they get caught really. The bees and wasps get really tangled up in this web. Um, and then the spider comes out and is, because it's so tangled, it's not moving around quite as much as you maybe see in some other webs. And the Amarobius walks around the spider and, um, sorry, the Amarobius walks around the bee or the wasp and disables its stinger first um, before dealing with the rest of the, the animal eating it, which is pretty cool. Um, I'll see if this charging has done enough to do anything else and perhaps looking at a male would be a good idea one of the ones that we've looked at um yeah yeah i think that would be that would be useful we've, we've seen a couple of female examples so it'd be good to see a male as well so i think well do is get a mail of one of the ones that we were looking at. Um, where is the thing gone? There we go. But of course, when the camera switches off, the thing showing the camera also just closes itself for some reason. Nice. So I have somewhere. Here we go. So this is a male um, Enoplugnatha ovata, or should be.
So I'll try and do this quickly before the battery dies again. I guess it has had quite a long outing. I mean, you can hopefully see the shape of the spider is very different from the female as well. It's a lot more elongate. You, you um, need to share your screen again, Chris. Oh, do I? Sorry. Because um, it closed. Oh, sorry, sorry. Is it work? Is it working? No. Uh, it's doing the same as it did before. I'm clicking on it and it's not sharing. Um, yeah, that's frustrating. Um, well, we we Sorry. knew that you could leave and rejoin, yep. and that, that solved yeah. um, the the problem last time. Just before before you try and do that, Catherine's um, made a comment and asked a, a question. Um, she's very interested in the spider wood ant interaction earlier. You mentioned that the spider injects venom into the head. Do they ingest the contents of the body from the head, the abdomen, or the whole body via the head? Yeah. So um, after when the, the spider injects venom and also its digestive or uh, juices into the into its prey, and then it will just suck those out through the hole it's made. Um, so it will just be through the head if it eats it at the time that it's caught it. Um, if it decides that it's not going, it doesn't need to eat it at this point in time, it can wrap it in silk and store it for later, at which point um, I, I'm not entirely sure if it goes back to the same hole or if it will make a new one. Mm. Gruesome. Yep. Right. I'm going to leave and come back and hopefully that works. <laughs> Brilliant. OK, thank you. There we go. Is that working? Yes, you're in now. As a, so you can the spy, this is an Enoplugnatha ovata male, and the you can see the shape is very different from the female. She was a lot rounder. He's quite elongate. Um, so these can sometimes be confused with tetragnathid spiders, long jawed orb weavers, which are a very different family. Just because the shape is just very similar um, with these guys. Um, but let's have a look at the palps. I always remembered that the males wore boxing gloves. <laughs> that is a good way of putting it. That's usually what I tell children. <laughs> yeah. Not that I'm saying you're a child. Uh, oh well, no, it's the it's the level of spider identification that I, I've I've uh, understood up to now. So, <laughs> cool. So yeah, you can see it, it can be tricky to manipulate a spider in such a way that you can clearly see its palps, which is why it's not great for beginners. You can get glass beads that you can put under them, which can help, and you can also pinch off the palps, which is what I tend to do. Um, There we go. So if you can see on the end of the palp, I'll see if I can get my cursor. Again, I could do with three arms. Um, so this is the palp here, and you can see it's got a lot of complicated structures and a little pointy bit. So what needs to be done is that needs to be compared to the book again. Uh, find my bag. So key with, um, can you spotlight me, Colin? Oh, sorry, Craig. Uh, yep, one moment. 
Oh, I think my camera's run out of batteries, but uh, again, but I think you have seen what we're looking at anyway. Um, yeah. So these are the palps um, of Enoplugnatha ovata and Latamana, and they're very similar, but there's a key difference, which is here, this feature points downwards in ovata and it kind of hooks upwards in Latamana. So when you're looking at the palps, what you would be looking for is the shape of that, at least that's what I would be looking for. Um, but again, it's about getting your eye in and seeing what the key differences are, um, because there are other differences between them, of course, and it may be that something stands out more to you than that feature does to me. Um, but that's pretty much how I do things um, in my head. I've, I've looked at a lot of spiders now. I've probably seen a ridiculous proportion of the species that occur in the UK. Um, and there's certain key features that I instantly am in homing in on um, to get that identification. So I think, unfortunately, my camera has given up the ghost. Um, but I think we're pretty much on the sort of time that we were running to anyway. Um, so I don't know if anyone has any questions that I could answer without the microscope. Yeah. Um... There's no questions coming through on the comments at the moment. Um, if uh, if everybody's happy for now, then I'm sure I'm sure you would be willing to answer any questions uh, once the the workshop's finished. If anybody wants to email me, um, then I can I can forward any additional questions on to you, Chris. Yeah, that would be fine. Um, and as we discussed earlier, uh, a, a list of resources, a resources document of some sort to circulate um, with a, with the feedback evaluation would be really useful. Um, and I think everybody that, that that's here would would appreciate that um, as a you know so that so that they're able to get started somewhere. Um, I've got another, Jason's asked, any particular spiders or habitats that need more surveys? Um, well, anywhere will be great. Um, there's sort of, I guess there are some habitats that are probably not recorded as well as others. Um, I think that probably mountain tops are not very well recorded, except for when I go there. <laughs> um, but yeah, any, anywhere, anywhere is on, everywhere is under recorded. So just record anywhere. Great. OK. OK, cool. That's fantastic. Well, Chris, thank you very much uh, from uh, on behalf of everybody else. I'm sure everybody's found it as interesting as I have and uh, particularly enjoyed your enthusiasm and passion for the subject that, that really comes across. And uh, hopefully everybody else has gained as much from it as I have. So. Um, thanks for your time and uh, to everybody else that's been in attendance as well. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming along. Like I said, I'll, uh, I'll circulate an email um, documents hopefully next week. Um, if, if we could get something out to, to everybody uh, at some point next week, that'd be, that'd be fantastic. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Hope it's been useful for people. Great. Thank thanks. you very much. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. All right.